Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. If y'all would open in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> if you were with us last week, we actually began this study and we had seven points, so I didn't want to do all seven points in one sermon because I know that would take a while, so we're going to finish it up this morning. So if you're looking at the bulletin and you look at your outline, you will see between point four and five, uh, there's a break there, and it says uh, what is new about the new life in Christ, part two. We'll pick up down there in just a moment. Before we do that, we, we want to go into the text that we're looking at. But I do want to remind everybody that our Vacation Bible School is rapidly approaching. June the 28th, we're going to have the cookout. Families invited for the cookout. And if you were here for Bible class, we mentioned that we're going to, uh, with the kids, have a canvas bag. At least that's what we're thinking. And they're going to be able to decorate that with paints. And it will dry Friday night. And then they can use that to take their things home from Saturday morning. So not only... <clears throat> not only are we going to need cooks to, and people to help serve, we're going to need people to help the kids with the hand painting. So uh, if you can help with that, make sure and let me know because we want to get these kids in here and get them to know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ like we do. And so that's coming up June the 28th. And then, of course, on the 29th, we're starting our actual vac vacation Bible school at 9 o'clock in the morning. Is that fan blowing too hot, hard? I don't know why you'd say that. I, I'm really trying to trying to figure out a way where it's not going to blow that hard. I thought it was just an earthquake. But. All right, maybe that maybe that'll do it. Did that help? It's still there, isn't it? Oh man. I guess I'm just going to be sweating in a minute. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and again, if you were with us last week, is it still doing it? I'll just turn it off. There we go. Do what? Okay, you're going to go to this mic? Hey, that's a great idea. All right, I'm putting the wireless there. I'm turning the fan back on. All right, so 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You remember beginning in verse number 11 that the Apostle Paul writes, uh, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You remember that he had just said in verse number 10 that we are all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ and we're going to give an account of what we've done, he says, in this body, and that's important for us to understand, we are judged by what we do now in this life, what we do in this body. And of course, you know, uh, and I, I'm going to chase a rabbit a couple of steps, people have said, well, what about cremation? If I'm cremated, does that mean that I'm going to be lost and go to hell? It's not what somebody does to your body. <laughs> That's beyond your control. That would mean I'm putting the fate of my soul in the hands of somebody else. I'm dead and gone, and they can determine where I'm going. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way at all. It's what we do in the King James, his body, this body, according to whether it's good or bad. We are judged by what we do in this life while we are alive. There's no purgatory. There's no second chances. What we do now is going to determine whether we spend an eternity in heaven with God or if we spend an eternity in hell with the devil and his angels. <clears throat> so verse number 11 gives us this thought now. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. So understanding that there is a God in heaven and understanding that that God is going to judge us on what we do in this life, Paul says you need to understand that the God that we serve will punish evildoers. He's going to punish them. 
And so he says, we then persuade men. It is our responsibility to help people see the truth of the gospel. So he says, but we are made manifest unto God, and I also trust uh, are made manifest in your conscience. For if we commend not our, for we commend not ourselves again to you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in the heart. For whether we be uh, beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. He's not saying that they were drunken. He's using the idea that people are mocking and ridiculing them, and they're saying they're crazy. That's what it means to be beside yourself. Or they're saying, man, these guys are just drunk. They, they, they're just drunk in what they're doing. And Paul says, no, we are doing what we do for your cause. And then he tells us, for the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, if one died for all, then we are all dead. But if he died for all, <coughs> that we should live, that we should not live henceforth unto themselves, but him that died for them. Wherefore, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Now here's the text for our sermon. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, Behold, all things are become new. We mentioned this last week, but when you look at this verse, you've heard lots of sermons based on it, and we understand. But the question that we're looking at, what changes in our life? What is new about this new life that we enjoy in Jesus Christ? Well, if you were with us last week, we pointed out we have a new standard. We don't live according to the way that we live before we obeyed the gospel. We are completely different. And by the way, people that are around us, <clears throat> they should recognize that we have changed. So we have a new standard. And as we pointed out last week, we have a new hope. The hope that we had before we were Christians we might have hoped, and, and you hear people say it all the time, well, man, I hope one day I get rich. I hope one day I get this. I hope one day I get... Our hope changes, and it is that we have a new hope, and that new hope is that as children of God, we can spend an eternity with our God in heaven. That's our new hope. And we said, based on that, we're going to have a new outlook on life. We're going to look at things completely different than we did before. We're going to look at them in the way that Jesus described. The writer of Hebrews said, We look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We've got a different outlook on our life. And we've got a new incentive. We're not doing things uh, based on old incentives. We're doing things now because we understand God will ultimately reward us if we continue to press on. And so that brings us to our lesson today. We have a new purpose in our lives. You know, in time past, and we all recognize this, we spent our time pleasing ourselves. You remember before you were a child of God. You remember the things that you did you did simply to please yourself. Whatever it was, the ultimate goal was, I want Kerry Clark to be happy, and so I'm going to do whatever I can design to just simply please ourselves. But we now recognize, because we have a new purpose in our life, that we are not pleasing ourselves, we are pleasing Almighty God. Let's turn to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, and if you've been in our adult Bible class, you know that we studied this verse last week. We're going to go back to it this morning, and we're going to notice that in verse number 22, 
that Luke records the then, then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was at Jerusalem and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch <clears throat> who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all, now watch this, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Did you see what Paul says here? That with purpose, or excuse me, Luke says here, that with purpose of heart. You know, and I, I realize that in one of the parables there's a man that stumbles on a treasure. He's not out looking for that treasure, but he stumbles on a treasure and he finds that treasure. We, we all remember this. But I want us to also remember that the majority of the time, we don't accidentally just stumble upon God. It's something that we've determined that we are going to do. And we set out to the best of our ability to try to find God. And so we with much purpose, the Bible says, are to cleave under our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so as we go back to 2 Corinthians, we notice that Paul very clearly says in verse number 14 of 2 Corinthians 5, the love of Christ constrains us. And we understand what it means to be constrained. It's the idea of being restrained. The love of Christ. Why do we as the people of God not react to situations the same way the world reacts to situations? I'm going to say that again because it's vitally important that we hear that. Why do we as Christians react to circumstances in the world differently from everybody else? It's because we recognize we've got a new purpose. You know, um, and I... Y'all, I'm trying to be as real as I can be this morning. We have become so politically minded in the United States that we think that if one man is elected president over another man, that tomorrow America's going to fall, she's going to crumble to the ground, and it's just doom, despair, is the hee-haw, agony on me, deep, dark depression, excessive misery. You know, it's just like, it, it, it's all bad. And you watch social media. And we've got members of the Lord's Church that are talking about civil war and things like that. Brethren, I, I'm shocked. That we don't understand God has given us a new purpose. And as we've said on a number of occasions, and I, you know that I love the United States of America. I think it's the greatest country that we could ever live in. But if she falls tomorrow, when we wake up in the morning, we're still Christians, right? We're still Christians. We, we, that has not changed our purpose. So, yes, are we concerned about politics? Are we concerned about the course of this nation? Yes. There's no way we couldn't be concerned. But, brethren, I also want us to understand our purpose is not to glorify a nation. Our purpose is to glorify God in heaven. And if we lose sight of that, brethren, we have lost our purpose. And we need to stop watching all the nonsense, get more into the book. It's interesting, we were in our Bible class this morning in Acts chapter 12. Peter has been arrested, James has been killed, Peter's in prison, Herod is about to kill him. And when God sends the angel to release Peter, he's asleep in the jail cell. Sound asleep. And as we pointed out this morning, the angel actually didn't just shake Peter. He had to smite him. He had to hit him to wake him up and then help him get up. So Peter realizes that this, this world is against him, but that's not going to change my outlook on life. 
I'm going to continue to worship God. I'm going to continue to serve God. And exterior circumstances do not change. And listen to me carefully. Exterior circumstances do not change the purpose of a child of God. It doesn't change us. And so Paul said, the love of Christ is restraining us. That's why, brethren, if we're living the Christian life, when we, somebody cuts us off in traffic, we don't start blowing the horn and chase them down when they exit and then get out at the first red light, jerk them out of the car and beat them up. That's what people in the world do. They do. If you don't believe it, you need to wake up. It happens all the time. Or pull out a gun and start shooting bullets across innocent lives that are all out there and we're in a rage and we're going to blow somebody up. We're going to shoot. Brethren, that's not the child of God. That's not our purpose. Our purpose, Paul says, is to glorify God. God and he says we understand in verse number 14 that because we judge that's we understand that if one died that's Jesus Christ for all then all are dead what does that mean brethren when we walk out this door we're walking in a graveyard now, I'm not saying the church building is holy. That's not my point. I am saying that when we leave this worship as children of God, we have now started walking in dead men's turf. They're dead. Well, what does that do? Well, he tells us in verse 15, since Jesus died for all, now watch this, and here's the new purpose that we're talking about. We should not henceforth live unto ourselves. But we live, he says, unto him that died and rose again. And he tells us in verse 16, we don't, we don't do what we do based on family ties. How many times have we known people that have changed their position on a biblical truth because somebody in their family has done it. Well, they've left the church. They've gone off to a false religion. And so now we're going to say, well, that's okay. It's fine. That religion's not really lost. Or that divorce, you know, it doesn't really matter. We do. We, you see it all the time. And the child of God, he tells us, you don't know people after the flesh. That means, brethren, and I, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to say this because I know it goes out on the world wide web. Y'all mean more to me than my earthly family. You do. Because we're brethren. Flesh is flesh. And flesh goes into the ground. Spirit lives on. We don't know people after the flesh. So brethren, we have a complete new purpose in our life. And because of that, we understand we're living under a new obligation. You know, we understand the word obligation. Uh, actually, the, the, I think the biblical word obligation is not in uh, at least the King James translation. But we know what our duty is. Duty is emphasized over and over in the Bible. So we're talking about obligations that we have. We understand. I have an obligation to my, my family. Paul tells us in 1 uh, uh, Timothy that if a man does not provide, 1 Thessalonians, if a man doesn't provide for his own house, his own family, he's denied the faith and he's worse than an infidel. That's an obligation. I have an obligation to my family as they are young to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. I have an obligation to my fleshly family that if they're in need and I have the wherewithal, I help them. We understand what an obligation is. But notice what Jesus said in Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. 
Jesus said in verse number 10, Luke uh, 17, I'm sorry, verse number 7, Luke 17 and verse 7. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come in from the field, go and sit down to meet, and will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. That's just the way things do. You don't go to your employees normally on a normal course of day-to-day -day activity and do their job for them, do you? It's their job. It's their duty, and you, you help them do it. And so he says you've got a servant that's out plowing a field, and he gets done plowing. When he comes in, you don't go out and serve him supper. You tell him, go ahead and get washed up because I'm getting hungry. <laughs> we look at that and we say, man, that's cold. No, that's life. That's the way life is. And so he says, you don't serve him. He serves you. Why? Verse number 9, he says, does he think that servant because he did the things which were commanded him? I trial, King James, I trial, no, I, th I don't think so. It's not the way we do things in life. That servant serves me. Then he eats and drinks. So Jesus said, that's the way it's done. Now watch this. So likewise, verse 10, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you. You know, uh, there are so many people that when they look at Luke 17 and verse 10, they blow a gasket. You mean I have to do what Jesus commands? Well, you're saying you earn your salvation. No, we're not. Look at the illustration. That servant was commanded to go out and plow that field. That servant was commanded, rise, wash, feed me, then you can take care of yourself. We are servants. And when we've done, Jesus said, those things that are commanded of us, all we can say is we are unprofitable servants. We have only done that which was our duty to do. Brethren, we don't earn our salvation any more than the slave earns his meal. Jesus is telling us that is the life of a servant. And we are servants of God. And so, brethren, Jesus said we have a responsibility. We have a duty. We have an obligation that is different. Our obligation now is to remain faithful to God. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to actually begin our reading in verse number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. In verse number 1, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Now notice he says, as apostles, we have this stewardship over the mysteries of God. That's the gospel, remember? Uh, you can go to uh, chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, and he talks about the unveiling. You see it in Ephesians 2, Ephesians 3, the unveiling of the mystery of God. Well, the apostles were given stewardship of that. And notice what he says in verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Are we going to be faithful on the day of judgment with the stewardship that God's given us when it comes to, like we talked about a moment ago, even our family? We've got responsibilities. By the way, the husband is told in Ephesians 6 and verse number 4, provoke not your children unto wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. We're to bring husbands, fathers, Bring your children up in the nurture and the admonition. Well, that's a woman's job. That's, that's the mindset that we see in the world. Well, that's, that's a woman's. No, it's not. God has given us 
men that responsibility. And when God gives us that duty, he tells us it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Verse 3, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. Paul said, go ahead and judge me. You can condemn me. You can say all manner of things about me. Paul, and brethren, I'm not trying to be overly blunt. Paul says, I simply don't care. If you think that I am this, or if you think I'm that, I really don't care. All I'm concerned about, my obligation, Paul says, is to God. And he says in verse 4, I know nothing by myself, yet I am not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. So brethren, we have a new obligation. And I want us to think about this, we also have a new reward. And you know, again, going back to the point that I made a moment ago, there are people in the world that they think if you do something to get a reward, well, that's just wrong. You should never do anything to get a reward. I don't think they believe that in day-to-day -day life. They don't believe that when it comes pay time. They've been working all week, and, and they're ready for their reward, their pay. They don't say, I don't worry about it. <laughs> they grab that check up, and they, you can't get between them and the bank because they want that money. And I'm, I'm not saying that's wrong. I understand that. That's reward. That's what we're doing. And so it's not wrong, brethren, to understand the concept God wants, He desires to reward us for our faithful labors in His kingdom. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. What we're getting at in Colossians chapter 2 is the point that God is faithful to reward his people. He says in verse 18, let no man beguile or trick you of the reward that you, and, I, and I'm filling in, that you have as a Christian. Let no man beguile you in your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. We're in verse 18. Worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So Paul, in writing to the brethren at Colossae, is telling them, be careful that you don't allow someone to somehow trick you out of the reward that you have with God by coming up with this false humility, this worshiping of celestial beings. He says in verse 19, and not holding the head... Jesus Christ is the head of the church. So we're not putting, if we do this, this, this false humility, this worshiping of things that are idols in a, a, a very real sense. He says, you're not giving the proper credit to the head of the church. He says, from which all the body by the joints and bands have nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? Taste not, or excuse me, touch not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. He says, which have these things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body. But he said, they have no honor in satisfying the flesh. So he says in verse 1 of chapter 3, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. By the right hand of God, set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. Brethren, we have a reward, and I ask you to turn to the book of 2 Peter for just a moment and begin with me in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 10. 2 Peter chapter 3 
in verse 10. He says, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Listen to verse 11, Seeing then that all these things, things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy, holy conversation and godliness? Now watch this. Do, does the Christian look for a new reward? He says in verse 12, Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, Christians, we look, he says, for the new heavens, or yes, a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Brethren, the child of God is a new creation. And there's a lot of things in our life that are new. I've got a new standard. Don't live like I used to. I've got a new hope. I've got a new outlook. I've got a new incentive. I've got a new purpose. I've got a new obligation. And I have a new reward. And so what's new about the new life in Christ? Well, I've just given seven, and that list doesn't even touch the hem of the garment. Things change. So this morning we ask the question, are you living faithfully to God? Remember what we read? We must live as stewards of God faithfully. <laughs> Are you doing that? You're not a Christian this morning. We ask that you obey the gospel plan of salvation. That gospel plan of salvation is that we hear the word of God, believe that word, repent of our sins, confess Jesus as the Christ, and be baptized for the remission of our sins. And brethren, when I've done all of that, I haven't earned my salvation. I am an unprofitable servant, Luke 17 and verse 10. I've simply done what was my obligation to do. So if you've never done that, we plead with you to respond. If you have a need, please come and to stand and to sing. <coughs>